Okay, I have 15 minutes to get this pre-round right so I can present this patient and impress my team. Oh no. Oh god. Uh, okay, let's let's start with the heart rate. That's that's easy. I'll just Uh, is that the blood pressure or the no, no. Uh, is that normal? Uh uh, maybe I can get a nurse to help me or something? No! Has this ever happened to you? Throughout all levels, we're hearing that students just want to be able to read a monitor quickly and accurately. By the end of this video, you, you will. will. Yeah! I'll first give you the general layout of the monitor. When you enter a patient's room, you will likely encounter something like this. Unfortunately, the positions and colors of the parameters are not standardized, so you may get variation from monitor to monitor. Also, the labels for the different vitals can be quite small, so it's important to make sure that you look at both the number and the tracing. In general, you'll see the heart rate at the top, blood pressure at the bottom, and your pulse ox and respiratory rate are usually in the middle. And now I'll hand it off to my co-host Liz to teach you about heart rate and blood pressure. When looking at heart rate, the most important things you'll need to know are that the normal adult heart rate is between 60 to 100 beats per minute, but always remember that context is key. A patient could be hypotensive due to a heart rate of 40, while this value may be normal for an athlete. The heart rate will be identified by an HR or PR beside or above it, and is presented in beats per minute. Heart rate is typically measured with EKG electrodes to detect the electrical impulses generated by the heart during each cardiac cycle. It is important to understand that you're only going to get a heart rate reading if the EKG electrodes are on the patient. So make sure your electrodes are properly attached to prevent false readings. Remember, no EKG electrodes, no readings. Also, don't mistake an artifact for tachycardia. A patient who is vigorously brushing their teeth can look like a VTAC on a monitor. Don't trust the monitor blindly. You have to always correlate with your physical exam. Proper lead placement is crucial to reading a patient's heart rate correctly. You can use the mnemonic, white on right, smoke over fire. In a standard three lead setup, lead two is the most commonly used for continuous cardiac monitoring because it gives a good view of the electrical activity of the heart. If lead two is not helpful for monitoring heart rate, you can switch to another lead. Abnormalities should be confirmed with a 12 lead EKG. Next, we'll move on to blood pressure. You can initiate collection by pressing the start button. The normal adult blood pressure is usually around 120 over 80, but always remember that context matters. A normal blood pressure may vary based on age, patient size, health conditions, and other factors. The non-invasive blood pressure machine may be programmed to measure blood pressure at specific intervals, like every 15 minutes, 30 minutes, or hourly, to monitor blood pressure changes and trends. The monitors can also be programmed to alert staff if the blood pressure readings fall outside of the preset parameters. Some common blood pressure reading traps to watch out for include white coat syndrome, recent exercise or caffeine intake, improper patient positioning, or talking during measurement. It's also important to obtain multiple readings. One high reading doesn't always indicate hypertension. It may also be due to stress and pain. Choose a cuff that wraps around the upper arm completely without being too tight or too loose. A cuff that's too small can overestimate blood pressure, while a cuff that's too large can underestimate it. It's crucial to remember the principle of treating the patient, not the number. Consider the patient's overall clinical picture rather than focusing solely on the numerical values displayed on the monitor. Now back to you, Echo. Now let's talk about pulse oximetry. Pulse oximetry is a non-invasive method used to measure the oxygen saturation level in your blood. It uses a small device called a pulse oximeter, pulse ox for short, typically attached to your fingertip or earlobe to give you an SpO2 reading. But how does it work? The pulse ox emits different wavelengths that pass through the vasculature in your fingertip. These infrared and visible light waves are absorbed differently by oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin. The device can then calculate the amount of oxygenated hemoglobin in your blood by analyzing the ratio of light absorption. While pulse oximetry is a simple, fast, and valuable tool, there are a few pitfalls to be aware of to get the most accurate reading possible. Things like cold extremities or peripheral vascular disease can also affect the accuracy. Additionally, in cases of severe hypotension or shock, the accuracy of the reading can be compromised. But in these cases, make sure to treat the patient in front of you. Finally, it seems simple, but make sure the sensor is placed properly on the patient's finger. There are other places the sensor can be placed, like the earlobe or toe, but the finger will provide the best reading in most cases. 
Most pulse oximeters use transmittance between an emitter and opposing sensors to measure the SpO2, so an oximeter should not be used on surfaces like the forehead, unless specifically designed for it. Now, let's talk about the waveform, also known as the plethysmograph, displayed on the monitor. The waveform gives us additional information beyond just the SpO2 percentage. The waveform should have a regular, pulsatile pattern. A smooth, consistent waveform indicates a good signal and reliable reading. Irregular or flat waveforms may suggest poor contact, motion artifacts, or low perfusion. Pay attention to the height of the peaks, which should correlate with the pulse amplitude. Lower peaks might indicate poor perfusion or a weak signal. If the waveform is poor, make sure the sensor is placed correctly and the patient is still. One more important thing to know is that the machine averages readings over a recent time range, so changes in saturation will be delayed. What it will cover is respiratory rate. Okay. Usually located, the next parameter we'll cover is respiratory rate. Usually located under the pulse ox, it is measured in breaths per minute. The one thing that makes this vital sign different from the rest is that you can see it. That comes in handy, as the respiratory rate can sometimes be unreliable. It is calculated by the monitor using a parameter called transthoracic impedance. A respiration signal is generated by supplying current between two of the EKG electrodes. The impedance is the difference in current between two electrodes, and breathing causes changes in impedance. The main issue with this form of measurement is that it is super error prone. Factors like the patient's body habitus, propensity to sweat, and even interference from other devices can introduce error. So what do we do? As always, we use our eyes. Even though the monitor uses a very technologically advanced method of calculating the patient's breathing rate, it is always best to verify this information against what you see. In times of doubt, you can use your phone or watch to count a patient's breaths per minute. Now on to temperature. Temperature, often listed at the bottom of the monitor, is a measurement of the patient's, well, temperature. It will be reported in either Celsius or Fahrenheit. The main thing to remember about the temperature parameter is that it is most often a static value and must be manually updated. On certain occasions, temperature can be measured in real time using a continuous probe, which can be inserted rectally or esophageally. In this case, you can more reasonably assume that the information presented is current. Now, back to Liz. There are a few other vital signs that you are likely to encounter, but they're a bit less common and are often reserved for surgery or the critical care setting. Let's explore them now. End tidal carbon dioxide, or capnometry, is the concentration of carbon dioxide in the breath at the end of expiration. It is measured by a carbon dioxide sensor that receives breath either through a nasal cannula or ventilation tubing. End tidal CO2 is measured in millimeters of mercury, and a normal range is between 35 and 45. A waveform version of end tidal CO2, called a capnograph, is used to visualize a patient's ventilation status in real time. Unlike pulse oximetry, capnography is a real-time waveform, not an average value, so it's a much more responsive method for assessing ventilation. End tidal CO2 can be used to monitor patients during surgery or sedation, as well as to assess the quality of chest compressions. In mechanically ventilated patients, end tidal CO2 is used to determine if a patient's minute ventilation is appropriate. For example, if a patient's end tidal CO2 increases, the tidal volume or ventilation rate may also need to be increased. End tidal CO2 is also used as a proxy value for arterial partial pressure of CO2 in critically ill patients with acid-base disorders. However, it is important to remember in patients with alveolar diffusion problems, such as pulmonary edema patients, end tidal CO2 will not be an accurate estimation of arterial CO2. For our final vital sign, take it away, Echo. Thank you, Liz. Arterial lines, also known as A-lines, are used for real-time measurement of systolic, diastolic, and mean arterial pressures. Placing an arterial line is an invasive procedure, so it should be reserved for patients where close blood pressure monitoring is needed, such as in surgery or the clinical care setting. Placing an arterial line involves inserting a catheter directly into an artery, most often the radial artery of the wrist, and measuring the blood pressure using a transducer. For accurate measurements, the transducer needs to be fixed at the level of the right atrium, and the tubing must be cleared of any air bubbles. If the patient's status does not seem to match the A-line blood pressure, check the blood pressure manually and inspect the A-line equipment. Arterial lines give standard numerical blood pressure values, as well as a waveform showing the change from systolic to diastolic pressure. For patients receiving vasoactive drugs or fluids, an arterial line can be used to get a more rapid and accurate blood pressure reading than an external cuff. A-lines can also be used to draw arterial blood gas samples, which are often needed to assess acid-based status of critically ill patients. With these tips, you should be able to handle any patient monitor that comes your way.